Time for a beer. We get working. We'll get there anyway, like it or not. You already did some work. Yeah. Oh, I was just fooling around. Hey, Pierre, that's really interesting. Like, uh, it seems more like uh, if you take Proclus's route, then you get really into the metaphysics of it, which is intellectually enriching, but not as, like, uh, transformative. And so it seems like this, this is like a, a contemplation for us that you offer. Yeah, his, go yeah, see, his goal is not to, to highlight, highlight the role of uh, providence. His goal is to put what's in the time is and within, as he understands, the metaphysics that develop from it. Though he mentions providence occasionally. So, uh, and therefore, would I really like to perhaps take a moment out? is to just look at the sentence that precedes this description of the sublunary gods at 40 GE. <clears throat> because we started with it with a certain view. Concerning the other divinities, to discover and declare their origin is too great a task for us. And we must trust those who have declared it aforetime, they being, as they affirmed, descendants of gods, and knowing well, no doubt, their own forefathers. It is, as I say, impossible to disbelieve, to disbelieve the children of gods, even though their statements lack either probable or necessary demonstration. And inasmuch as they profess to speak of family matters, we must follow custom and believe them. And uh, let's look at Thomas Taylor's translation of that same section. And tell me whether or not it makes any difference. Ah, oh, good to volunteer. Okay. <clears throat> but to speak concerning the other daemons? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. But to speak, this is 442 in the Thomas Taylor. But to speak concerning the other daemons and to know their generation is a talk beyond our ability to perform. It is therefore necessary in this case to believe in ancient men, who being the progeny of the gods, as they themselves assert, must have a clear knowledge of their parents. <clears throat> it is impossible, therefore, not to believe in the children of the gods, though they should speak without probable and necessary arguments. But as they declare that their nar narration, narrations are about affairs to which they are naturally allied, it is proper that, complying with the law, we should assert assent to their tradition. In this manner, then, according to them, the generation of these gods is to be described. Hmm. Make any difference? Yep, but I don't know exactly what yet.
to speak, however, concerning the other gods or demons, mm -hmm. and to know their generation exceeds our ability. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. What does that mean? Very strange thing. It would seem. Yeah, go ahead. No, I don't have any idea. Sorry, I don't have any idea. It just seems like a weird sentence right now. It is. So. Hmm. Seems to be a gloss. Means we can't talk about it, so let's just trust it. He's glossing the statement. He's not really. He's not really saying. Let's get into this. But, but we already know it because somebody else has said it. Oh. So I don't need to repeat it here. Let's get on with it. Are we doing it? We are. But it exceeds our ability. Yes. Okay. It exceeds our ability, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to piggyback on someone else. But now our ability is... So let's push. Where did we leave off last trip? 4D... Right, that great quote that starts, God of gods, agree? That's where we are? 41B. Shall I read? Or where you want to go? Go ahead. Thank you. God of gods, those works whereof I am framer and father, are indissoluble, save by my will. For though all that is bound may be dissolved, yet to will to dissolve that which is fairly joined together, and in good case, were the deed of a wicked one. Wherefore you also, seeing that you were generated, are not wholly immortal or indissoluble, yet in no wise shall you be dissolved, nor incur the doom of death, seeing that in my will you possess a bond greater and more sovereign than the bonds wherewith at your birth you were bound together. Now therefore, what I manifest and declare unto you do you learn. Three mortal kinds shall remain ungenerated, but if these come not into being, the heaven will be imperfect, for it will not contain within itself the whole sum of the kinds of living creatures yet contain them it must, if it is to be fully perfect. But if by my doing these creatures came into existence and partook of life, they would be made equal unto gods. In order, therefore, that they may be mortal, and that this world all may be truly all, do you turn yourselves, as nature directs, to the work of fashioning these living creatures imitating the power shown by me in my generating of you. Now so much of them as it is, now so much of them as it is proper to designate immortal, the part we call divine, which rules supreme in those mm, one more time. Okay. Now so much of them as it is proper to designate immortal, the part we call divine, which rules supreme in those who are fain to follow justice always, and yourselves, that part I will deliver unto you when I have sown it and given it origin. For the rest, do you weave together the mortal with the immortal, and thereby fashion and generate living creatures, and give them food that they may grow, and when they waste away, receive them to yourselves again. Thus he spoke, and once more into the former bowl, wherein he had blended and mixed the soul of the universe, he poured the residue of the previous material, mixing it in somewhat the same manner, yet no longer with a uniform and invariable purity, but second and third in degree of purity. And when he had compounded the whole, 
he divided it into souls equal in number to the stars, and each several soul he assigned to one star. And setting them each, as it were, in a chariot, he showed them the nature of the universe, and declared unto them the laws of destiny, namely, how that the first birth should be one and the same ordained for all, in order that none may be slighted by him, and how it was needful that they, when sown each into his own proper organ of time, should grow into the most God-fearing of living creatures, and that, since human nature is twofold, the superior sex is that which hereafter should be designated man. And when by virtue of necessity they should be implanted in bodies, and their bodies are subject to in influx and efflux, these results would necessarily follow. First, sensation that is innate and common to all, proceeding from violent affections. Secondly, desire mingled, mingled with pleasure and pain, and besides these, fear and anger, and all such emotions as are naturally allied thereto, and all such as are of a different and opposite character. And if they shall master these, they will live justly, but if they are mastered, unjustly. And he that has lived his appointed time well shall return again to his abode in his native star, and shall gain a life that is blessed and congenial. But whoso has failed therein shall be changed into woman's nature at the second birth. And if in that shape he still refraineth not from wickedness, he shall be changed every time, according to the nature of his wickedness, into some bestial form after the similitude of his own nature. Nor in his changing shall he cease from woes, until he yields himself to the revolution of the same and similar that is within him, and dominating by force of reason that burdensome mass which afterward adhered to him of fire and water and earth and air, a mass tumultuous and irrational, returns again to the semblance of his first and best state. When he had fully declared unto them all these ordinances, to the end that he might be blameless in respect of the future wickedness of any one of them, he proceeded to sow them, some in the earth, some in the moon, others in the rest of the organs of time. Following upon this sowing, he delivered over to the young gods the task of molding mortal bodies, and of framing and controlling all the rest of the human soul, which it was still necessary to add, together with all that belonged thereto, and of governing this mortal creature in the be most beautiful and best way possible, to the utmost of their power, except in so far as it might itself become the cause of its own evils. So he then, <coughs> having given all these commands, was abiding in his own proper and wanted state. And as he thus abode, his children gave heed to their father's command and obeyed it. They took the immortal principle of the mortal living creature, and in imitating their own maker, they borrowed from the cosmos portions of fire and earth and water and air, as if meaning to pay them back. And the portions so taken, they cemented together. But it was not with those indissoluble bonds wherewith they themselves were joined that they fastened together the portions, but with numerous pegs, invisible for smallness. And thus they constructed out of them all each several body, and within bodies subject to inflow and outflow, they bound the revolution of the immortal soul. The souls then, being thus bound within a mighty river, neither mastered it nor were mastered, but with violence they rolled along and were rolled along themselves, so that the whole of the living creature was moved, but in such a random way that its progress was disorderly and irrational, since it partook of all the six motions, for it progressed forward and backwards, and again to its right and to left, and upwards and downwards, wandering every way in all the six directions. For while the flood which foamed in and streamed out, as it supplied the food, was immense, still greater was the tumult produced within each creature as a result of the colliding bodies, 
when the body of a creature happened to meet and collide with alien fire from without, or with a solid lump of earth, or liquid glidings of water, or when it was overtaken by a tempest of winds driven by air, and when the emotions, due to all these causes, rushing through the body, impinged upon the soul, for these reasons all such motions were then termed sensations, and are still so termed today. Moreover, since at the, that time they were causing, for the moment, constant and widespread motion, joining with a perpetually flowing stream and moving and violently shaking the revolutions of the soul, they totally blocked the course of the same by flowing contrary thereto, and hindered it thereby in its route ruling and its going. While on the other hand, they so shook up the course of the other, that in the three several intervals of the double and the triple, and in the mean terms and the binding links of the three halves, four thirds, and nine eighths, these being not totally dissoluble save by him who had bound them together, they produced all manner of twistings and caused in their circles fractures and disruptions of every possible time, kind, with the result that, as they barely held together one with another, they moved indeed, but moved irrationally, being at one time reversed, at another time oblique, and again upside down. Suppose, for example, that a man is in an upside-down position, with his head resting on the earth, and his feet touching something above. Then, in this position of the man relative to that of the onlookers, his right will appear left to them, and his left right, and so will theirs to him. This and such like are just what the revolutions of the soul experience with intensity. And every time they happen upon any external object, whether it be of the class of the same or of the other, they proclaim it to be the same or something or other than something <coughs> or other than something contrary to the truth, and thereby prove themselves false and foolish and devoid at such times of any revolution that rules and guides. And whenever external sensations in their movement collide with these revolutions and sweep along with them, also the whole vessel of the soul, then the revolutions, though actually mastered, appear to have the mastery. Hence it comes about that, because of all these affections, now as in the beginning, so often as the soul is bound within a mortal body, it becomes, at the first, irrational. But as soon as the stream of increase and nutriment enters in less volume, and the revolutions calm down and pursue their own path, becoming more stable as time proceeds, then at length, as the several circles move, each according to its natural track, their revolutions are straightened out, and they announce the same and the other aright, and thereby they render their possessor intelligent. And if so be that this state of his soul be reinforced by right educational training, the man becomes wholly sound and faultless, having grasped the having escaped the worst of maladies. But if he has been wholly negligent therein, after passing a lame existence in life, he returns again unperfected and unreasoning to Hades. These results, however, come about at a later time. Regarding the subjects now before us, we must give a more exact exposition, and also regarding the subjects anterior to these, namely, generation of bodies in their several parts, and the causes and divine counsels whereby the soul has come into existence. We must hold fast to the most probable account, and proceed accordingly in the exposition now to be given. Okay, let's, uh, well, there's a whole description of the irrational side, so let's pick it up from 44D. That's a shift. Take a look on the top of 99 and below. 44. Got it? But Eight. as soon as... Uh, take a look. Right. Take a moment out. Look at it yourself. 44D? Yes, it's on page 99. It's uh, <clears throat> called 
44B on the top. But as soon as that's the transition. Mm -hmm. Not yet. Uh, oh, I got oh, it. Oh, quite as soon, yeah. Okay. Good old Emprone. Intelligent? Mm -hmm. That's what he's called, mm -hmm. intelligent. Mm -hmm. They announce the right. Mm -hmm. They announce the same in the other mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. hmm. Same and other, a way to see it in terms of the emotional life of man. Agree? There we have it. Agree? Mm -hmm. Take a look at how it's done. It shouldn't be intelligent, should it? Because it's nothing intellectual. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. If so be, right? If so be that this state of the mm -hmm. soul is reinforced by right educational training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pai, 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 pai du seos, right? Go ahead, please. Well, I was just saying that uh, they're giving right um, educational training, and it looks like they're saying it's actually um, orfe trofe pai, du, pai deu seos, right? Using the word. It's not paideia, but it's a similar, uh, from a similar root. Pai deu seos. Right? So, nur the, the, the right nurture of education? Pardon? And that, that's helpful because... Look, everything now that <coughs> follows in this dialogue follows from this paragraph. Okay, so just take a look wow. and see if that's true. Come on, hmm. see if that's true. Everything follows this paragraph, the rest of the, the, rest of the dialogue. Definitely the highest of goals, right? This is, mm -hmm. he's talking about the achievement of the highest, the, the perfection, the way we began. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
But to conclude further that this leads off the entire rest of the dialogue, I have to see more than I see now. But that's just, that's what the claim he's making. Oh. What does it mean? These results, everything that was said before it, mm -hmm. come about at a later time. Regarding the subjects now mm. before us, we must give a more exact exposition. And also regarding the subjects anterior to these, namely the generation of bodies in their several parts, the causes, and the causes and divine counsels whereby the soul has come into existence, we must hold fast to the most probable account and proceed accordingly in the exposition now to be given. So what does that mean? That, that, that this, this, they're going to talk about this very subject. That's right. So everything that proceeds from this paragraph is anchored in this paragraph, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <coughs> See? We're back here. See? That's where this is. See? He's got to get the body in the proper condition so that the right mind and phrenesis can function. So therefore you can all the way down. That's the condition for providence. Mm. Right. Proper motion, right. balancing. Right. So that's Taylor So let's take a look at the same thing from Thomas. Yeah, you have Thomas? I do. Well Yeah, did you got anyone? Well here? actually he was just saying seeing something in the Thomas, so perhaps he'd be Taylor the Taylor ideal calls person. That perfect health. I mean, <clears throat> I mean did sense. you Well I think he wants the section. Yeah. Yeah. section. You got the text? Yeah, I don't know. Thomas? Where same there. paragraph. Yeah, go ahead. The but as soon as. Uh, does that begin with the senses? Okay, it's a different kind of start. Right, it, it, that's what, it looks like that's right. But when certain senses pour along externally? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but when certain senses pour along externally, strike against the soul and attract the whole of its receptacle, then the circulations which are in reality in subjection appear to have dominion. And hence, in consequence of all these passions, the soul becomes insane at present, and was so from the first period of her being bound in a mortal body. However, when the river of increase in nutrition flows along with a more gentle and less abundant course, the circulations being again restored to tranquility, proceed in their proper path in process of time become more regular and steady and pass into a figure accommodated to their nature. Hence, in this case, the revolutions of each in the circles becoming direct and calling both same and different by their proper appellations, they render the being by whom they are possessed prudent and wise. If anyone therefore receives a proper education, in conjunction with convenient nutriment, such a one will possess perfect health and will every way avoid the most grievous disease. But when this is neglected by any individual, such a one, proceeding along the path of life in a lame condition, will again pass into Hades imperfect and destitute of intelligence. These are the particulars, however, which happen posterior to the production of mankind, but it is our business at present to discourse, discourse more accurately concerning the first composition of our nature and to show in the first place from assimilative reasons through what cause and providence of the gods the several members of the body were accommodated to the several employments of the soul. And he's telling us how to read from this point on, isn't he? <clears throat> what cars and problems? 
You have to keep in mind the preceding parts. Yes. Right. Especially. Yeah. Does that match uh, 29 D4, by the way? Brokelis ends here. No, that's right. Book five in Brokelis. And it's Time As, volume two. This, uh, what Taylor called prudent and wise, and what they call intelligent here. Pardon me? Taylor said prudent and wise, that's what he said. He said it will render that person clear and wise. I don't have the other words I heard. And this one, it says, uh, render their possessor intelligent. No, uh, that's not intelligence, is it? Is that the uh, M. Froda? Because yes. there's nothing intellectual in that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just, I wanted someone to clarify that, how that was uh, intelligence or what it was instead. I wanted to know the Greek. I wanted no, to know forget the, the Greek. Greek doesn't mean a thing. It's not that, that may be helpful, but uh, is there is there any activity that you could label recollecting, pondering, <coughs> uh, reasoning in that section where he uses the word intelligence? Is that activity that is just being described, does it fit into, in general, reasoning or intelligence or the intellectual functioning? No. Therefore, you know it's the wrong word. Right. So he goes on the next sentence to describe that state as perfect health. If one were to receive proper education from that state, they would receive perfect health. And the low describes that as wholly sound. And faultless. Pardon? Pardon? Well, I was just saying, there's two adjectives, wholly sound and faultless. Wholly sound and faultless. I was wondering, what's the word they use for wholly sound? It looks like holocleros hugies. Who gives right hygiene? Yeah. Um, then being in that state that was just described, then you can go on, right? Then the soul, right? If so be that the state of his soul be reinforced by right educational training, the man becomes sound and faultless. Whatever is going to be in the variation of idea. Do you have a reading on a which is what's coming, rounds? which is essentially what's coming. Hmm. Holo Kleros, the term for holy. S well, yes, yes. You want me to look it up? In could here? you? Yes. That'd be great. No, but I, uh, now, if you wanted to have a little more fun, uh, and if you wanted to get further into the sublunary gods and what they're doing. Might it be that this whole section that followed the sublunary gods and they are mentioning each of them in the nine, but he's describing the nature of man to this point. By the way, would that fit the model? What is, he, is, he, is it possible he's talking about one of the gods and the condition of one of the gods? Well, let me... Hazard another guess. Suppose as you go further, you can like, locate all of them in the following section. Hmm. I'd be sure. Would that be a guess? Yep. <laughs> okay. so if the 
away the sublunary gods are said to function. Um, what if that, that way of functioning is detailed from this point on to the end of the work? Would that be interesting? I mean, just taking a wild guess. <laughs> what that what might that indicate? If so, I mean if so, no. Then really make sure you know the myth and all of the characters in the myth so that as you read forward uh, you can just place it right in there. Thank you. Device. Someone, come, more? Someone else? Come on. Maybe Wonderful. the right educational training. Uh, mm -hmm. more. And he's divided the dialogue at this point and given us the key to mm -hmm. understand the whole of it, and especially the part okay. after. Okay. What does that say about time ends? Thank you so much. I don't know. What would you say that says about time ends if such reasoning follows? You like the demi-argos. Pardon me? You like the demi-argos. Oh. I just wondered about the opening lines in the uh, dialogue. Good support. Very, very opening line. This one, yeah. What other? His, his first words. Nash. But you have to go back over that reasoning before you get too much into the first sentence. What follows if what we're just announcing can be said to be true? I mean, it be approved by and if you keep your mind on what he just said, everything that came before it, anterior to it? Okay, just wondered. Sir? Is that your point? He's just describing mankind? Hmm. Would, what would that say about time is, then? The guy? Or? Okay. So, um, anyone remember the uh, beginning of the early part of the Plato's Phaedo. <coughs> right. They mention how many people were there and, and Plato wasn't there. Plato was ill. Was he was the, ill? Yeah. He couldn't be then among the 14? Right. Yeah. Oh, does that have any meaning for the dialogue as a whole? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, what? Well, there's the 14, there's a myth of Theseus, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. And that might indicate that? That Plato was not among the 14 victims who were sent to the Minotaur. That he wouldn't need to be saved by the hero. Right. Ah. So what's the beginning of the dialogue again? Where's the fourth? Who's missing? I missed. Plato. Mm -hmm. Oh, Plato. Why would he miss this? Hmm. Oh, are you kidding me? Okay, that's a, that's a fun joke. Oh. <laughs> 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 just read. Right, it's just a fun joke. Why Plato? Oh, God, I thought he must ask this question. What's the punchline? <laughs> read a little bit further. I don't know, I just thought I'd pop it to you just because you guys are interested yeah, in think. chuckling away at night. He's sick. I asked this long time ago. He says he's laid up. Yeah. It's not necessary for him somehow. Well, he's laid up. He's in front. I want to see Barbara. In the fetal. 
Go ahead. No, I was just... Um, so the point just prior to this was if the dialogue is structured to with the henatic structure, right, that has the, that, that Timaeus is, re, is um, following the model of the henatic sublunary gods. And then I thought, I, know, I think it was Josh's point was saying, therefore, it was a uh, unfolding of creation. Or, I said he was like the demiurgos. Right. I'll take that if you like that. Yeah. Okay. So then you're saying, then that would be one of the things that Plato would be missing, right? He wouldn't be necessary to him. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Some, well, it wouldn't. If it follows parallel to the Phaedo, this, he's... No, no, okay. Keep the question, okay? If, if it can be said what we are saying, what does that say about time is? He's... That's all. He's giving this talk. Yes. That time is is and he thinks one of the children of God. beyond our ability to fathom or to show any probable arguments for it. And yet he's following... But if it turns out that... Right, if it turns out then he is not, it's not beyond his ability. And then he's doing something that he thinks is beyond his ability to do. Right. And doesn't know it. And doesn't know it. Hmm. Hmm. But then you, I'm still left with them. Why would Plato be absent? Because Plato can do it, and is aware that he can do it. He wrote the dialogue. Well, mm, okay. No, 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 no. It's just, yeah. just, no, no. I just don't know. You got this stuff. You got this stuff. Okay. See, the question is going to be whether or not time is, is able to demonstrate that this presentation that he is giving demonstrates the providence of God. Right. That's the key point. And can you talk about the providence of God without talking about the gods? Hmm. And what does he think about this set of gods that apparently is needed to show providence going to man? That they can't, that he, that we can't talk about them. It's not possible Therefore, to speak about them. Therefore, there's an Achilles heel, and the time is. Yes. Ah. Hmm. Hmm. But if you see, then Plato is present. Oh, that's fine. But if you see, then Plato is present. And able to speak, yeah. and therefore maybe a descendant of God, mm -hmm. child of God, or beyond that. Hmm. No, it's just playful. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You know. It's still unclear, though. Well, ask her. Okay. She seems <laughs> to understand. You got it. I just offered it. Act of fooling around. If Timaeus is not able to do it, then who's doing it? If we see it, then Plato was was able to do it. Right. There's one more piece. Well, he, if we do it, are we doing something? If we see it, that, well, we're doing something that Timaeus says is impossible to do. Right. Timaeus is doing it without being aware of doing right. it. Right. But if if we're capable of seeing the hene, henatic structure, then we're capable of talking about as well as seeing the the this, the gods and and speaking about them. Right. And that would be. That a would higher vision. The higher yeah. vision. A higher vision than Timaeus's, which has got to be Plato's vision. But we're bringing it, we're seeing it. That's the way to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Depends upon blah, 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 blah. Yes. Seeing the, yes. Whether, they, the, whether it's there or not. Where's the character of Timaeus from? The name isn't mm -hmm. chosen at random, right? What? The name Timaeus isn't chosen at random, is it? Like, what did you say? He wants to know where Timaeus is from. Like the word. Oh, I don't know. Someplace. 
<laughs> He's a Pythagorean from Italy. No, the name. I oh, sorry. I thought you were asking where the cat is from. Yeah, is, it a, is, he, a, is he a Pythagorean in the, in the dialogue? That's the idea. That's what Proclus says. Uh, he doesn't say it in the dialogue. Jump in. He's from Italy. That's what Pythagorean. There's a, in my translation, it, it says... Uh, Tom Hess is, is talking here in the first paragraph. So surely, if we are not quite crazy as we embark on our account, my, my interest is, is, why is he talking about crazy? Sure. Crazy or... It's the first paragraph. It's in this particular translation. Why does the translator use the word crazy? Hmm. Not quite crazy. It's Timaeus. No, no, no. This is. Uh, oh, you're talking about the uh, beginning of the speech. Yeah, the beginning of the speech. Okay, why don't so we call it? What the fuck? What you got nothing else to do? Well, what was the joke? What was the joke? <laughs> I have no idea. It was a poor joke. It didn't work. Well, I heard you and Barbara go through a sort of rational account. You know, it didn't seem that funny, you know, though profound. So I was. It depends upon a couple of steps, doesn't it? Okay. First up, if this is true, what follows? For whom, for the speaker, time is, what follows, what can we say about him? I'd either answer that or we can't proceed further. Well, in the second, the second thing that Socrates says in the whole work, he tasks Timaeus, if not Timaeus and the other two guys, with filling up the place filling up the place of the missing person, Plato. And so I thought it follows, if what we were saying is true, that Timaeus has indeed filled up his place. But Plato's writing, I thought there might that might be the joke. I wasn't sure. By the way, you want to talk about this or what you want to talk about? I'm here? sorry, I thought it was. No, no, no. No. <laughs> The way you were answering it is to say, how can what you're saying be true if I think that this is true? That's what you're offering. What are you saying? What you just offered was not following what we were developing to talk about time is. You were talking about uh, all of the discussions that are mentioned and what time is is going to do to fulfill an obligation that he picked up from previous talks. Is that not true? Yeah. That's the point we're making, isn't it? Right, but I, I saw it as contingent yeah, upon yeah. the discussion. That's interesting, that. but why don't you stay on this one? Is there a mention of some sublunary gods, yes or no? Yes. Oh, oh, oh. If they function in a certain way, and one can see that function in the dialogue that time is, then would that show that Timaeus understood the sublunary gods or not? Since he says it is beyond our ability, it is beyond our ability to understand them. Try it he did positively. It. If he understood it, let us assume he understood it, then as he went through the work, he could have then dispersed the, each of the nine gods throughout the text where it's appropriate for them to show that manifestation, and the work then would be the same thing, but it would be structured around those nine gods and how they function in the uh, uh, final phase of the generation of the universe, that is to say, the generation of, of mankind and visible, sensible things. Agree? Sure. He didn't do that. 
Cut in. Oh, no. What? I don't know if he's done that. Oh, God. Well, he either did or he didn't. If he did it, then he would be showing that he does understand these nine gods, and it is not beyond his ability. Yes. Louder? Yes. Thank you. By the way, if he doesn't, but yet they're there, that would show something curious, wouldn't it? What? Something, we have to find some other reason why they're there. Because it should be there if you understood the myth. Hmm. Those nine gods. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. But if, <laughs> if the way in which he is describing the generation or the process of generation, if he in fact is then using similar ideas that are manifested in the nine gods and doesn't mention it, then maybe he didn't see it either. Well, by the way, he does think it's beyond his ability, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Curious, isn't it? Yeah. If it's there, but he thinks it's beyond his ability? Yes. Well, that's a joke. Now, see if you can answer the question. Why is the work designed around an author who says there's something beyond his ability, yet he sees the way those very gods function in the text without recognizing they are the very gods he thinks is beyond their ability? Does that give you a puzzle? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. You got it. <laughs> Well, I've got a puzzle. Good! But mm. to see that it's a joke, I need to, I don't know. I guess I'm shy about that one. Uh, see the joke now, now that you've got the puzzle. By the way, <coughs> I wonder why the, the dialogue begins with one, two, three, where's the fourth? Who might be missing? Plato. Oh, if so using the Phaedo as an example, he couldn't be said to be among the fourteen, or he would have been those, one of those who fear death, and therefore would be someone who is uh, not a philosopher, not a true philosopher. So, All right. so why, why would someone be absent for this? The irony, of course, is Plato wrote it. Yes. <coughs> He might be absent for it if he was beyond it. He was beyond it. Mm -hmm. In the same way. Or he's a, beyond it in what sense, Barbara? Beyond it in exactly what we were talking about. Well, Socrates is present, and he's certainly interested. And this is Plato's teacher, so I'm not clear what you mean by he would be beyond it. Right? No, but you see, he is in other <coughs> dialogues just about to the same degree, the sophist. Agree? Doesn't uh, say anything in the sophist. How about the statesman? Socrates doesn't. I'm sorry. Plato. Mm -hmm. I haven't touched the, the sophist. The point you were making is, but Socrates is in the dialogue. Yes. Right. <coughs> Therefore, that must count for something. And so I came back and said, by the way, it plays only a minor role the dialogue called the sophist. Would you agree with that? I haven't looked at it in a while, but yes, let's just say I do. Nevertheless, I just, so I got therefore, this. Yeah. Okay, therefore, the presence of Socrates is not in itself an indication of the value, philosophically, of what's being discussed. Well, at the very least, he's listening right. and watching. Right. At the very least, he's present, right? I mean, when we talk about Plato being beyond, it sounds like Plato's a snob, right? Like, you know, he's Talk beyond this type of discussion. Him. You said there's something significant about him being present. If he's present but doesn't say anything, mm -hmm. then you have to say something about that. Mm -hmm. Not that merely that okay. he is present. I'm with you. Especially on a dialogue called the sophist. Mm -hmm. Or the statesman. Now you got two riddles on top of the first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, 
We now find Socrates present at the sophos, since it's an exercise in sophistry. Ah, enough, what do you say? Done enough. Okay.